we're good to go. Okay, perfect. I'm going to call this uh, MOA and GBOS quarterly meeting to order now. It's April 29th. The Grid Board of Supervisors, its committee and subcommittees are subject to the Alaska Open Meetings Act as found as Alaska Statute 404.62.310 and Anchorage Municipal Code 1.25 public meetings. The Grid Board of Supervisors operates under the Girdwood Public Meeting Standards of Conduct. My name is Jennifer Wingard. I'm the GBOS co-chair and land use supervisor. And I am going to go to, uh, I think we have Guy Wade online and then Mike. Guy Wade, <coughs> um, Parks and Rec, M3 supervisor. Hi, hey, Mike Edgington, Housing Economic Development Supervisor. Okay. And I think we have two others that are on their way. We'll announce when they arrive. The Girdwood Board of Supervisors acknowledges the indigenous peoples of Alaska whose land we reside on. The community of Girdwood, situated between the areas known to be Denana and Alutic homeland, respects the people who were stewards of this land for generations. We commit to the continued stewardship of this land and are grateful to be a part of a wider community that seeks to maintain a sustainable use of Girdwood Valley for present and future peoples. I'll start with uh, Motion to approve the agenda. I think we have some changes to make, but let's start with them. I'll move to approve. Second. Thank you, Gun. So we have a request to move item number one towards the end so that everyone who, who uh, wants to speak to it can. Do we have any objections to making that move? Okay, I'm going to go by assent on that unless anyone wants to talk about or do anything else. And do we have any other uh, changes or additions to make to the agenda? All right. Hearing none, I will say that we have uh, the, the, the agenda is approved by assent and we'll jump in to uh, number two after. Actually, let's see. Um, who we have online besides our GBOS members. Um, I'd like to start with uh, Tiffany Briggs. Hi, Tiffany Briggs, MOA Real Estate Director. Thank you. And Emma? Hi, Emma Gibney, Heritage Land Bank Land Management Officer. And Craig? Hi, Craig Lyon, Municipal Planning Director. And Kent Colhays? Hello, everyone. Kent Colhays, Municipal Manager. And then finally, Nicole. Hi, this is Nicole Jones Vogel. I'm a contractor for the MOA for Heritage Land Bank. Thank you all, Nicole, for being here and for attending. Uh, let's start out with agenda item number two, which is our HLB items, starting with uh, it looks like our Holton Hills project update. Hi there, thank you. I'll take that one. Um, so we are um, the the plat is being finalized and getting signed this week. Um, it's making its rounds to various municipal departments that have to sign off on those, and then it will be recorded. Um, hopefully next week sometime, um, the disposal of tracks one and two would be um, disposed of to CY Investments. Okay, do we have any uh, questions or comments about that? I have one question, Mike here. Um, it's the question I, I ask regularly. I just wonder where, the, the, where we are with the contractor oh, to represent I don't know. the municipal. <laughs> I should have talked about that as well. Um, so the RFP is, or the response to the RFP is out. Um, going out for review to see if they are a um, qualified respondent. Assuming that they are, then um, it goes, I tell purchasing that we um, are ready to negotiate with them. So that's in the final final stretches as well. Okay. I know this is an easy question to ask and a hard one to answer, but do you have any sense of time scale for that? Um, I would think think it should be pretty close to when we're wrapping up the disposal of the land as well. 
OK, so a couple of weeks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I have a quick question. So the um, the disposal to see why investments happens uh, basically immediately after it's recorded. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Or as close to immediately as the title company can do. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Do we have anything else on that item? Okay. Not hearing anything. I'm going to go on next to the Group of Investor Park Development Options Update. This is Nicole. I'll um, sort of take the lead on this conversation. Um, if I could get a sense of the time frame you'd like me to stay in. We did this presentation at the HLBAC last week and it was about 45 minutes. So I feel like that might be a little bit too long for this venue. We we'll try to keep the meeting to an hour. Right, we're trying to keep the meeting to an hour. Let me check with my the other members of GVOS. I know I uh, listened to that uh, presentation online. I don't know if uh, my other the other members did here. Mike and Guy, what do you think? I only heard the last few minutes of it because I was uh, I had a conflict for the first part of the meeting. I think I know item three is probably going to be less than five minutes. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I I, don't, I haven't seen it. Uh, a quick version of it, though, and, you know, if we have questions, we can stop and ask, you know, along the way would be nice. Okay, okay. Well, I'll, I'll try to keep the presentation to about 15 minutes and then um, we can kind of get into some questions. And it sounds like there's some pretty good familiarity with with the, the project in general. So, um, Again, my name is Nicole. I am a contractor for the municipality of Anchorage. I was previously an HLB employee um, when phase one of the industrial park was completed and subdivided and leased to the current um, owners now of the phase one of the industrial park. So I'm pretty familiar with the site. Um, what this presentation will do is kind of talk about how we got to this point. Um, the coordination that we've done, the feasibility study in the draft sort of state that it's in, and we'll talk about the staff recommendation. And I'm just going to put it out there what the staff recommendation is now so that you can kind of ease in and relax into the presentation because there's a lot of um, details. And that is that without doing an appraisal, it's very difficult to understand the financial implications of any of the options that we do. We tried looking at both the 14 and the 2016 appraisals and try to make sense of them for today and it just it it didn't really make sense and it didn't seem like a good way to um, inform a preferred alternative for these four options and what we're asking today of gbos is any initial feedback that you have comments um, that you'd like us to address and then also, if there are gaps in the information that we're pulling, we'd like to know those. Um, what We got some information from our HLBAC commissioners last week, and we plan on formalizing that into a written document and um, sharing that uh, with our commission and GBOS um, once that's complete. Last October, we held a work session with the HLBAC commissioners. We did um, a meeting um, in Girdwood with some of our permittees and talked about um, various aspects that we would need to take into consideration as we looked at doing next phases in the industrial park. And we um, did our best to incorporate all of these nine um, components, thinking that those were the things that will need to be understood to make a recommendation on a path forward. In the 2023 plan and then in the 2024 draft HLB work plan, there were four identified options for going forward with the industrial park. And I'm, I'm not going to read these, but we'll go through each of the options um, as we go through the presentation. You're going to see a lot of maps um, as we dive into this. The map with the red, these are all the easements in the area. So there's Public use easements, trail easements, access easements, utility easements. There's there's quite a bit going on in here. So option one is disposing of the property as is. So that would be the entire area outside of phase one. Um, 
this would be the least amount of lift for HLB. It would put the most uh, flexibility into the private sector for determining what the ultimate layout design would be of the industrial park. <clears throat> um, there is some discussion um, about would HLB want to or would the community want to track out just the um, uh, industrially zoned areas of phase one and then keep all of these stream, stream, stream setbacks and easements in municipal ownership. Um, that's sort of like a 1B option, um, if you will. Uh, the maps on the side here, so the top going from top left and going clockwise, aerial imagery, wetland impact, uh, easements, which we just talked about, and then the fourth one is the zoning layer. So that sort of, I don't know, like yellowish, beige-ish color, that's what's currently zoned industrial. The Gerwood area plan, both the 95 and the draft plan show an area larger than that for industrial land. <clears throat> so it's possible that that area could be rezoned and the industrially um, zoned area could be larger potentially. Um, in each of these options, we have the same data shown for anticipated construction costs, usable land, how many lots will be created, and then some additional um, process um, considerations. So I think for the most part, um, I've mentioned the process considerations, but if we were to move forward with option one, we would get an appraisal, we'd do a competitive bid, and then follow the disposal process. This option would have about 15 plus acres of usable land, and that would depend on if someone were to um, rezone that area to match what um, the land use designation in the Gerwood area plan is. Um, so that would be what that, that plus part would be. Any immediate questions on option number one? I can, I can see how the um, anticipated income is really just sales price. It's based on appraisal only. Is that the way to read it? Correct. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's some consideration of would we do a lease um, and consider that as a potential option, but this this would be yeah, this would be disposal as is was more of the thinking. But as you think, as we consider the other ones, looking at fee simple disposal versus leases, another potential um, evaluation point. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Option number two, this is sort of the creative version. Um, we um, internally as staff um, uh, coordinated with planning and AWW and um, our private um, development folks and we were looking at the maximum amount of land being available for use with the least amount of infrastructure improvement costs. And so this is very conceptual, um, but it would result in four larger tracks. They range sort of between like four and or three and a half and seven acres or something, um, pr pretty much the 15 acres that you saw in option one. Um, this would allow access to each of the um, parcels from the cul-de-sac. We would need to do a uh, track we, need, we would need to subdivide this so that what's currently the temporary turnaround would need to be made a permanent turnaround and then um, utilities are brought to the end most of the utilities and at the midpoint of lot five in phase one um, some considerations for this um let's see uh yeah the the larger uh, lots would be probably what we've heard is preferable. Um, some of the lots in phase one, there, I don't know if you <laughs> were around with, it was very difficult to take permittees and put them on uh, platted lots. Um, permits, permit areas are very nebulous and, and platted lots are very defined. And so getting folks on their lots was, was challenging. And with this, there'd be more space. The other thing um, that we tried to, I guess, thread the needle, if you were, um, if you would, is that this potentially 
has the ability to extend into some very far off um, phase three option. And that's because um, if you were to look at this um, flag lot here off the cul-de-sac, um, there is a public use easement right here. And then th going off the cul-de-sac, this aligns with what was proposed in the 2014 um, flat approval process as the right-of-way location. And so if the municipality were to retain this tract, we could potentially at some later date then extend utilities, road, and all of that to get to um, further areas in the um, industrial park. Again, the uh, maps, same information, um, aerial imagery, easements, zoning, and wetlands. The anticipated construction costs for that um, utility work and platting and that stuff would be about $160,000. The acres of usable land is 14, or just under 15 acres. Um, of that, you can see there are about two and a half acres of wetlands. This would create four lots. Um, one of the things I haven't mentioned yet is that in the preliminary, the approved preliminary plat, which has expired, um, that includes both phase two and phase three, there was public access at the end of phase two. So kind of in this location, it would kind of bifurcate this um, track, this proposed track. There were um, access easements to get to uh, the streams here. So that would be something that would uh, potentially we would want to look at. This would require a replat. Um, and I see a hand up. Happy to answer a question. Oh, yeah, got it. I see a, a hand down. Right. Okay, keep going. <laughs> um, yep, sorry about that. Um, have those wetlands been delineated recently, or are they just off a of MOA GIS, um, you know, file, or have they been have they actually been delineated within those areas? Yeah, they those those wetlands have been delineated, um, and that was done several years ago. But I think we got an approved jurisdictional determination, and and I know that because when we worked with the contractor that brought in that fill. We went out and staked the, the edges of those. So um, there, there probably you know someone would potentially want to redo that, but they're they're pretty accurate. Thank you. Okay, so as far as next steps for this particular option, um, we'd be looking at doing a replat um, appraisal, credit bid, and then again the disposal process. This particular option. Uh, would not require any rezoning and the area is the maximum amount of area that could be utilized based on the zoning layout. Um, there's potentially on that last lot, um, the one on the phase one side, it could go up and back behind lot five, but we tried to also incorporate the layout as much as we could to what was approved in 2014. Any questions before I move on? Right, Doesn't look like... oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, please. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to jump to option four because uh, option three can be easily understood after we look at four. And four would be the complete um, build out of what was approved in the preliminary plat in 2014 and that is phase two which are these first six lots and then phase three which would be these remainder 11 i believe yeah 11 lots <clears throat> this particular approach um 
would be the full build out. It would require a rezoning. It would require um, utilities brought all the way to what would be the new turnaround at the end. Um, one of the things that really adds a lot of cost to this project is the need for a sewer lift station. So anything past this temporary cul-de-sac here would require that um, additional AWW sewer um, infrastructure. Um, but this would result in the um, most amount of individually platted lots in the industrial park. Um, the anticipated construction costs for this option are just over $3 million. The amount of acres that would be available just under 17 with three acres of um, class A wetlands. Uh, 17 lots, like I mentioned. Uh, again, replat, this would trigger that rezoning that we talked about, and then a similar process after that. And this is the alignment that was proposed and approved in 2014, and just the first phase of this with AWW's hallway services and those five privately now privately owned lots um, were completed at that time. Um, here's sort of a breakdown of the anticipated construction costs. Um, this is where we worked with our um, private development uh, folks and planning and AWW. Um, we did receive some initial comments and feedback from our commissioners uh, last week. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna mention those really quickly and then I'm happy to or we 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 are happy to hear your comments, your feedback, where more information might be needed um, as we continue on in the process. So um, the first, uh, well, they're not, they're in no particular order. Uh, one of our commissioners suggested that we evaluate um, whether or not fragment lot subdivision would be appropriate for the subdivision, which would potentially allow um, construction across lot lines um, as a reason for considering that as an option if those lots in phases two and phases three would be too small for industrial uses. Um, on their own. Um, the other thing that we heard was to check with um, GBSA to ensure that the space that is um, uh, currently proposed for their area is sufficient. Um, the analysis between uh, a ground lease versus a fee simple sale, uh, making sure that we include all the consulting fees and that Sort of bottom line analysis and then um, moving forward with the appraisal our commissioners requested that we at minimum get an appraisal on options one which is the at um, disposing as is an option four with the full build out um, one of the things that i think is important to note is that with all of these proposals um, we are not at this time proposing to develop the lots themselves so while we would if we did option four that would result in the planning and the infrastructure improvements but we would not be clearing grubbing filling leveling bringing above base flood elevation all of those lots so just um to kind of um, spell that out and then just generally the industrial park has come a long long way <laughs> um from even just 2000 or even just 2015, um, there's been a lot of improvements. And I think that um, while at times they've been challenging um, to get to where we are today, I think that the, the steps that have been made have had quite a bit of impact. And um, we really are looking for guidance to make sure that we uh, go the way that is necessary on the next step. So with that, I'm happy to um, take any feedback, questions, comments um, as we continue forward. So Mike, you have a question? Yeah, a couple of questions. First one is, uh, could you could you share option three just so we 
Oh, so yeah. we at least know what it was. Yes, so option three is basically the first part of phase three, phase two. Um, it would not ultimately result in any additional areas opened up in the industrial park. Um, and but it would require more infrastructure spending. Correct. Yes, and so, yeah, so I yeah. <laughs> got ahead of myself. I'm sorry, I should have come back and done this one. No, it's fine. I uh, understand so, why you didn't show it. <laughs> it it's, not, it's not the most clear solution for um, next steps, but this would, you know, be a considerable lift financially. It, it doesn't increase any area, usable area. It does create six lots, but most of them are currently being used. Yeah, I understand. So yeah, I I agree. Option three doesn't seem to be, it doesn't it doesn't seem to be better than four or, or two or one. Um, my second question was um, the if we look back at if we back, look back, I think at option two, which was a partial, actually option one, yeah, option two. Um, if although the, there isn't a lift station um, as terms of infrastructure, if you're going to use those lots for anything which would have construction, you know, maybe building and things like that, is it actually feasible to use the, to connect to the sewer system? Presumably they're lower than the than the existing sewer system. I mean, that'd be the reason there's a lift station in the plans. Yeah, so we are working under the understanding that extending the sewer just a little bit further to the end of the cold cul-de-sac wouldn't require that lift station, but I believe you would need to have something on the lot to pump it up right. to the main, yeah. Okay, but then it's just on the lot, so it's whatever is necessary for that level of facility, not for a main system. And I believe that that's true of the lots in phase one, too. And none of them right. have hooked up yeah. to sewer yet. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, that's one of that's one of the issues. We've got, the, we've got these five lots, but none of them have really done development on the land itself. Um, so I guess one of my one of my thought of thought experiments is if you look at each of these options, if, for example, someone came ahead with a proposal to build small manufacturing facility or something, I'm not sure anyone will. But let's say that as an example um, with, um, you know, with with the needs for office space and the other things that go along with that and presumably connection to infrastructure, can it work under all, all options? Um, and, you know, is there a huge cost component that we're pushing onto uh, the individual owners if uh, we go with some options rather than others? And it looks like the answer is maybe, but we you know that that's one way to think about this problem. Um, I did have a third question as well, just very quickly. Um, you mentioned, I think, in option two that you'd probably recommend the or you might recommend the MOA can, um, keeps the ownership of the effectively the the the, the um, the one to the southwest. Um, okay. I don't remember which one it is. Um, that's and then the I think the one to the east or northeast is also the one that currently has uh, GVSA um, use, isn't it? So that would be that would be more of a transfer within um, the Muni, and then HLB would keep ownership potentially of the other one, maybe or maybe lease it out and keep ownership. Correct. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah, they're my main questions. Thanks. I just want to quickly state we have uh, Brian Burnett and Brianna Sullivan have joined us on the, the Gerda Board of Supervisors table there. Do we have any other uh, questions or comments about this? Did we have staff? Did you have any feedback on this? Um, uh, Nicole, thank you for putting this together. And uh, so the next step would be to get the appraisal. Would you be having the appraisal look at the different options or just the appraisal of the existing tract as is now? So. Um, the feedback that we got from our commission is to evaluate um, option one and option four for an appraisal. Okay. Could there be consideration for option two? There, there could be, yeah. So one of the things that I've been thinking, and I, and I, I mentioned this, but let me say it in another way. Um, when we were looking at the appraisals that were done in 2014 and 2016, the main difference between those two appraisals was the first one was done um, as is, sort of like option one, right, where the lots need to be clear, they need to be graded, they need to be filled, they're unusable, like in, you know, mostly phase two and phase three, right? And then the appraisal that was done in 2016 for the first five lots 
<laughs> by the time that was done, those lots were pretty well utilized. They're flat. They've, you know, some of the permittees have added fill. So they, their appraisal rate per square foot was almost four times what was done for the as is. And so that's really the what we're looking at in doing an appraisal this next time is these lots are going to be mostly, you know, I mean, portions of the ones in phase two are, you know, have been filled and I mean, they're not perfect, but they're much better than they were in 2014. But that cost difference between having a lot that's ready to be able to be used versus one that needs considerable amount of um, on-site work. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I have one quick question. I, you mentioned the feedback you've received from the commission. Have you received any feedback about these options yet from the other users of the industrial park? Yeah, so we met with some of them in October, but we wanted to come back to the commission and DDOS before we had another conversation with permittees. So we do plan on making sure that they have this information and answering any questions that they have. Okay. All right, do we have any other questions or comments on this topic? Yeah, I've got another one. Um, so I'm trying to think through practically the differences between option one and option two. And I, I agree, I think it might be, I, to me, option two looks like something worth investigating. Three definitely doesn't, but two definitely, I wouldn't rule out immediately yet. Um, so with option one, we're effectively saying someone comes along and offers you money to take the problem away and it gets resolved somehow in the future. Um, there's no additional, um, there's not necessarily any additional um, lots that become available. Presumably they'd have to at least um, honor the existing permits for some period of time. Um, or maybe in perpetuity, I just don't know. So how would that, how would it, what would it, what would the experience be from either someone who's currently using one of the permitted lots or, um, you know, us as a community looking to, you know, how this is going to get used in three or four years time? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it, I think that there's a lot of potential avenues for that, right? So we could just do a competitive bid and just put it out there and the highest bidder gets the property. We could do like an RFP process and say, hey, we want, an industrial park who's going to submit on this and how are they going to construct that so i think that there's some some nuances that can be ironed out um so i don't i don't know that i know the answer to that um but i think your first sort of like reaction was you know basically someone pays us and makes the problem go away is kind of this option in a nutshell yeah and it sounds very attractive from your perspective i completely understand that um but uh, we uh, do you know, has any, has there been any kind of informal discussion or anyone expressed any kind of interest in this or any similar projects happening elsewhere in the state? Or would this be a first of? I, I'm not aware of any conversations. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I guess my, my main comment is I, I think I'll, I can see some benefits over for option two over option one, um, but it does preclude option four. I think I don't see any value in three. I don't. I think that that sense is right. Three is uh, three sits uncomfortably between two others. And I have one quick comment or question about uh, your considerations. And I, the these charts are super helpful. Thank you. But uh, I, I can't help but notice that kind of none of them include community input, I really appreciate this conversation and everything else, but to the to elaborate on the point Mike just kind of hinted at, uh, one of, I, I think one of the considerations should be the community involvement in the growth of a really key part or the development of a super key part of our community in Valley. And so I just can't help but notice that cell is missing. Yeah, I, I definitely appreciate that comment. And I think that we started that conversation with our commission, right? So like, how, you know, once we get all this information together, I mean, that's going to be a hard decision. Like we're talking about weighting goals, right? What what are we trying to achieve with the development of this project? So I I think that there's quite a few more questions to be answered. Of course, you know, we have our HLB process, we have our work plan, you know, we're at the point where we're doing this feasibility study. So we are certainly looking for input um, and we will be circling back with those permittees that are currently down there to 
um, get some more um, kind of on the ground uh, perspective. Really appreciate all the work you've done on this. Thank you. Sorry, did we have a uh, cut? Yeah, one more comment, Nicole, is um, you know something to consider here because there's a precedent here with the first five uh, platted lots. You know those the access to those or the ownership to those who was the first right of refusal to the existing leaseholders. And so as you approach this public comment or this uh, input, especially with the leasees is uh, having a determination somewhat of what HLB will do um, with the current uh, leasees down there or permittees um, down there. Um, would they have first right refusal to buying a lot or a track or whatever it may play out um, like the like the owners do in the existing platted lots. So it's just something for you guys to put in your basket as you work through these problems. Yeah, and, and just to respond to that, Kyle, if you remember that particular thing, that was a, a notwithstanding um, that the assembly approved. So that that um, did not follow HLB code. So that would be something that would need to be repeated. And I think some of the differences between phase one and phase two is we have and there's maybe like one or two people in phase two that have been had had some serious longevity um, but in phase one we have permits back to like i don't know the early 90s um, for some of those areas so it's a little bit different of a scenario but i totally get what you're saying there's going to be expectations and we need to figure out how to work through those so that they follow code and and are also you know competitively open for anybody who wants to be working in the industrial park so Yes, Brianna. Thank you. Uh, really quick. Thank you, Nicole. In case you already said it, just I didn't hear the first bit of your presentation. What is the timeline of the feasibility study? If you already said it, I will listen to it later. Um, I did not say specifically, um, but our recommendation is next step is to get an appraisal. Um, without having real numbers of what the value is for this land, it's really difficult to make a uh, decision um, on what um, the price points are for, for each of the options. So. We hope to sort of get it in a pretty good um, format, you know, here soon. And then once that appraisal um, is available, then we would have something really meaningful to uh, respond to. Thank you. Can I just echo the uh, thanks that everyone else has given as well, Nicole and, uh, and HLB in general. Thank you very much for going through this uh, process and explaining all the different issues. Um, I do have um, one last question I guess is the obviously the price tag for option three but option four is uh, very high um, you um, HLB has the at least theoretical capability of getting grants and other funding sources as well doesn't it it's not just it has to come out of your operating funds correct okay right thank you mm -hmm. thanks okay. again. yeah thank you all Thank you very much. Nothing else on that one. We're moving on now to discussion of the Gerber levy on HLB managed land. And I can take that one. This is Emma, uh, Heritage Land McLean Management Officer. Um, so yeah, this was first brought up at our, I think it was our February HLBAC meeting. Um, so we, I went down to Girdwood, I think it was at the end of March um, and I walked on the levy, I, you know, um, took some photos, took a video just to, I had never been to that area. So um, I just wanted to kind of see if there was any immediate um, concerns. I didn't see anything that was an immediate concern. Um, so that was a relief. And then since then, we've been um, digging in our paper files and our digital files that we have for that parcel. And um, I know the concern is, are there, um, you know, reporting requirements or who's in charge of the levy? Is there, you know, who has uh, jurisdiction in that area? And there's nothing that popped out immediately from the paper files and the digital files. We've been doing some deeper digging. We've been looking at the reference documents. Um, we've, started a conversation with DOT to see if, and and then probably going to look um, to the railroad also to see if they have any historical knowledge of the area. If any anybody in Girdwood has any historical knowledge of when, um, when that was, when that structure was built or when um, 
people started using it for private access, which is not actually platted or an easement. Um, you know, that that could be informative um, on uh, while we're doing our research. Um, but I we will continue our conversation with DOT and looking into um, the history of that area. And we will get back to you about that. Or if there's any really specific questions, um, I can note them while we're doing our search. Thank you. Do you have any questions or comments about that? Um, I guess I, the, sorry, after you. Go ahead, Mike, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, it, it was actually Emma's comment about um, the access. Um, my understanding is the, from uh, Senator Carlton in the previous meeting that we, I, th I thought we did consider that access something we are managing or we're at least maintaining. Is that correct, Kyle, or did I misunderstand the last meeting? Uh, we maintain it. Uh, it has well the service area has been maintained historically um right like since it's been there so and historic so yeah that's been a access and what i learned from um local residents who are down there post 1964 uh some of those people living there um sometime uh 65 66 uh that levy was put in to um uh to bring Old Town back, because that was where the water was coming in, was through that portion there. Um, and so, um, it, you know, and it was put in, what I understand, through a variety of different people and probably also some influence from um, DOT and Alaska Railroad uh, trying to access that tra train abutment bridge there um, at the other end. So um, it's definitely a straight line between the two. So. Um, so there was some access that way. So since then, it's just maintained as a as a access to the private properties to that area. Does the does the lack of the easement cause any problems for um, GVSA in terms of maintaining that access road? Uh, well, it's it's not in the right of way that's established, but that's not unusual in Gerwood. Uh, okay. In the there's many roads that are outside the right of way that the service area maintains because that's where historically it's been. Um, so uh, I do think going forward that if we're looking to do a large capital project, then yes, we're going to run into yeah. issues. Um, yeah. So, you know, the road, if there's a capital project, the road should be built into the existing platted right of way that's undeveloped. Okay, got it. So thank you. Brianna, could you? Uh, thank you. I would just add to Emma's uh, sort of question and comment, in, a comment, and that is that people in our community are researching and doing a lot of work on this question and trying to meet with DOT. So I would just encourage you and HLB to uh, contact the railroad and DOT as well so that there's more information gathered for future meetings or whenever these groups come together and are able to talk to HLB. Don't because that was our last meeting. It's been weeks since then, so perhaps more has been learned since. All right. Do we have anything else on the levy? Not on the levy. Can I just ask one other general HLB question? This should be very quick. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to um, just check. I, I think the. Um, I just wanted to confirm the uh, HLB plan wasn't was postponed by the assembly last time. Is that coming up next Tuesday? Not tomorrow, is it? Is it next Tuesday or is it later in May? Um, yes, it's May the 7th. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. OK, moving on, then we have the Griffin Airport project in land use. OK, if I take this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, so uh, this is something we discussed several meetings ago um, and just sort of brought it to the attention of uh, the municipal manager and some of his staff. Um, and uh, I know uh, Craig Planning Director was at that meeting as well. And uh, I just wanted to kind of bring it up since we've got at least one step further in this process and uh, DOT has uh, approved the um, land lease. So I think the planning work and um, 
the other things that the developer are going to start doing uh, is ready to begin. Uh, my understanding from DOT is uh, they will, they do not require, in fact, they, they uh, discourage um, developers from approaching uh, the municipality for a land use permit. Um, and obviously that's not the, you know, I think many of us is understanding of uh, municipal code. Um, they have not, however, issued a building uh, construction permit, and I think the construction permit is needed even before grubbing and clearing. So uh, it doesn't look like there's going to be a uh, an, an immediate conflict, but I would imagine that happening in the next 12 months or so. So if there was any you know, update on the position of the municipality, that would be helpful. Um, if it can't be discussed here, I understand that as well. Uh, this is Craig. I don't know if Kent has anything to say that might be different from mine, but the discussion I've had with the Department of Law was based on the information that was available to the municipality and the Department of Law. Uh, municipal zoning for Good Girdwood would apply to this project on state land. Um, uh, zoning doesn't apply to runways, taxiways, air traffic control towers, etc., anything related to aircraft movement, but otherwise uh we have nothing that would suggest it does not apply to this other other things related to this project okay thank you yeah that's my understanding as well and i think uh, you know many people are of the similar opinion obviously at some point we have we have these two different opinions in direct conflict to each other so i don't know how that gets resolved beforehand or whether we have to wait for you know an action and uh, i'll leave that to smarter people than me but thank you. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate the clarity. You're welcome. It is helpful. Thank you. Do you have, yes, Brianna. I'm not sure if I do have a question yet, Mr. Lyon. Thank you for being here. But I had specific questions from community about the roads that lead to the airport and to the project and the impact of those roads. So would this be appropriate to ask now or email those? Or are they not relevant now? Uh, well, I guess it depends on what the questions are. Um, easier, easiest way is to email it, but I, I can, I can take a swing at it. I did the transportation planning world for about 18 years here, but uh, the boundaries of the planning organization stopped at Potter Marsh, so I've never, not 100% solid on what happens down in Curdwood. To tell you the truth, that might be, Kyle might be better able to answer that. But okay, well, well, thank you. I'll just, just. The blanket kind of statement is if the MOA intends to address any damage to the roads and the safety of the residents and who pays for repairing the damaged MOA roads if this operation is approved. So how is the MOA involved with the road structures? I'll just give you a little background on this, you know, um, we have two segments of ownership on this access to the airport. One is DOT, which they own from the Mount Hood and Lake Tahoe intersection. And then it is uh, the service area MOA uh, road uh, right away back up to Alaska Highway. Um, we would definitely probably work with right away enforcement um, to identify the road. Uh, there, there's no, uh, I don't believe there's any permitting required for haul routes. Um, so we would have to identify what the roads look like and then see if the damage was caused by the contractor who was building down there. So, so yeah, it's a little bit of a complicated issue. You know, we have contractors that work all over town and they do a cause road damage. And sometimes we get reports afterwards and then we have to figure out if they actually are liable for what they've done. So, um, so yeah, the, there's no permitting requirement to use the roads for hauling in construction sites so yes uh, one quick follow-up would be if is the moa involved in the traffic study at all i wouldn't know the answer to that greg do you know if they the required traffic study um well, I'd have to double check that. I don't know for sure. Um, not positive. I can find out, though. Thank you. Thank you. 
have anything else on this topic? Okay, moving on. Uh, the looking for the latest information regarding the handling of homeless issue and the effects in Girdwood. Uh, I'll, I'll address this um, just to um, I mean, start the conversation here, and and um, you know, I was looking for Mike Brown to be here too as well. But Kent, you could probably help in answering some of these questions. But um, we have. Uh, several uh, locations um, that have become encampments um, here in Gerwood, and um, we're receiving a lot of questions from the community about what what or can be done um, related to those areas. Uh, one in commercial district, another in the parks, um, and so we want to get a perspective as to what is happening in Anchorage. We know that there has been some abatements um, um, posted, and um, and then if, if those um, could or should be carried out here in Gerwood um, and trying to get understanding more about uh, those steps. So, um, so I'll sort of open it up there. I don't know if, can you, if you can answer any of those questions or what, what the current status is uh, from the administration with uh, you know, operating and policies related to it. Uh, I can touch on a high level. Um, Kyle, um, we the city the municipality is abating some some areas, Davis Park most recently, and then Cuddy Park. So it, it's a it's a process. We post them typically twenty or so days in advance, and then we do some outreach, work with the people who are camped there. The challenge is having a place for them to go. Right now, we don't have shelter space, so we're not directing people to shelter space. We're just um, um, informing them that the area where they are currently located is going to be abated. And those are typically, we're limiting those right now to areas for either public safety or municipal need. Um, so it's not a widespread abatement. Um, Mike Brand, if would, and Alexis would really be the ones to talk to about the specifics of abating in a specific area. So I, I don't have much more than that to really offer to help, Kyle. Okay. Okay, do we have any other questions or comments about this? How could I do? Uh, how could we follow up with Mike Braniff to as a board from this meeting? I guess that's anyone. Well, I could ask uh, Mike. Go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, I could ask Mike to attend your next meeting and uh, we could put it as a topic on there. Um, he was, uh, I talked to him earlier, he was going to try the Mickey meeting, but he had a conflict. So he couldn't be here. Um, so yeah, I could ask him to be there. And then Mike, you have a question? Yeah, it's a kind of comment more than a question. There are multiple things changing and moving at the moment on this topic. Obviously, we have the Supreme Court looking at um, Grants Pass case. Um, there was at least there's start there was starting to be a discussion about a different um, uh, different options to be put in code that the assembly had a couple of weeks ago, which I have not fully caught up with. Um, so I know there are changes afoot and other things being proposed. So it probably makes sense to start this conversation now and then revisit it again at our next quarterly meeting. Anything else? Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Public comment. Persons offering public comment must state their full name and address. Public comment is limited to three minutes per person and must be on subjects not listed on the agenda. Do we have any public comment? Okay, hey, like that, I would look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Great conversation. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.